This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome new listeners joining us on affiliate stations in all 50 states, as well as members of our armed forces who are tuning in over the Internet today. Thank you for your emails and letters and guest suggestions and for making us part of your news week. In just a moment, our nation's first undersecretary of emergency preparedness and response under the Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Michael Brown, will be joining the program to take a look at just how prepared American cities, towns, and neighborhoods are for a natural or unnatural disaster. In the wake of the recent bombing in Manchester, The flooding in the south and midwest of the United States and the threat of a nuclear or biological weapons attack looming. What should we and the federal, state and local government do? I mean, what what can we do to prepare for such disasters? We're going to find out from one of the world's foremost experts on disaster response and preparedness during the next hour. But before Mr. Brown joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Michael Brown was born in Oklahoma and earned his undergraduate degree from Central State University and his law degree from Oklahoma City University. While in law school, Brown was appointed Finance Committee Staff Director for the Oklahoma Legislature from 1980 to 82, after which he went into private practice and taught at Oklahoma City University Law School. When George Bush was elected president, Brown joined FEMA as general counsel, Bush later nominated him as deputy director in 2002, and in 2003, he was nominated and sworn in as the nation's first undersecretary of emergency preparedness and response, a position he stepped down from in 2005. And since that time, Brown wrote the best-selling book, Deadly Indifference, The Perfect Political Storm, Hurricane Katrina, The Bush White House, and Beyond. And he has been sharing his disaster experience with governments and organizations around the world. Brown also hosts the popular syndicated radio program, The Michael Brown Show. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report former Undersecretary of Emergency Preparedness and Response, Mr. Michael Brown. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Brown. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Well, I'm I'm so excited to have you on, particularly this week when we are witnessing a live example of a swift, organized response to an emergency in Manchester. The British government and police, along with nearby civilians, they moved in very quickly to take care of the injured and the displaced. And and as you know, within 24 hours, uh, they the British government had identified the cell responsible for the attack. The prime minister has also elevated the threat level in the country. I wonder if you'd care to comment on the response thus far. Well, the, the response, as you pointed out, Rebecca, is, is exactly what we would expect. Uh, we wouldn't expect anything less than, than what the Brits did. Uh, I think we would see that in almost any developed nation in the world. I think, though, that oftentimes we get complacent because we see a response like this. We see that, in, in, in particular, a terrorist event where there's already at, at a venue uh, you can think of almost any place where a terrorist event might occur in the United States, a, a sporting event, a concert, a shopping mall, a, a government building. Since 9-11, we have hardened those, those spots, and we have recognized that we have to be able to respond immediately. So not to downplay the response, but I think people look at the response and think, wow, isn't that great? That's really good. And what we fail to do is we fail to think about everything that goes into place before that response has to occur. That's the preparation phase. That's the, the, that's the intelligence phase. Those are all the things that go into play that hopefully, one, prevent those things from happening if it's a man-made disaster, or in this case, a terrorist event, or if it's a natural disaster, or it's a blackout, It is some uh, uh, problem with the power grid. Have we done the things to prepare for those events? Because we will respond, and we will respond well. 
And, and, and what my fear is, and one of the reasons I wrote the book and one of the reasons I still speak all around the country and the world to people, is that we focus on the response, we don't think about the preparedness, and the response is so good that we become complacent and we think that, oh, look, in, for example, in Manchester, the response was quick, it was effective, it was strong, and so we think as citizens we don't have to do anything. Okay, but, but with, let me ask you this. Let, let, we, yeah. we know when a tornado or a tsunami is coming, we get a warning. But when the government says there's a high probability of a terrorist attack, as the English prime minister recently did, what's a person on the street supposed to do with that information? I'm kind of confused. I want to do something, but <laughs> I, I, I have no idea what to do when the threat is high or low. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let, let me put it in very personal terms. My, my, my wife says that because of my six years in the government and all of the really horrific things that I saw from 9-11 to the tsunami in Southeast Asia, the Hurricane Katrina, all of this death and destruction and all of the ways that terrorism can affect us or natural man-made disasters can affect us, she claims it has perverted my mind. And I say it's not, it hasn't perverted my mind. It's made me situationally aware of my surroundings. Okay, but and, and what do we so, do when we know the, the, the probability is high? There's a high alert in England right now. What should the person on the street be doing? Paying attention. That's the most important advice I can give to anybody, regardless of whether it's a terrorist event or anything else, and that is to be aware of your surroundings. Pay attention to how many people walk into it, and, and, I, and I still – I, I mean, I apologize for this, but I kind of chuckle under my under my breath. People walk into a movie theater. People walk into a sporting event, and they're so excited about the event. The event they never take time to look around. You know, you go to a movie in the United States, and what do you hear now? Pay attention to your surroundings. Look at the exit that might be in front of you or in back of you. You get on an airplane. The flight attendants tell you. The emergency exits are located, you know, two in the front, two over the wings, and two in the rear. There's lighting on the floor. Look for the exit that is nearest to you, and it may be behind you. How many people actually take the time to mentally, and I'm not saying you have to stand up and look up in front, look around, look, but how many people take the moment to no, mentally nobody. We're think all, about We're all wrapping up our phone, our phone calls Thank and our you. text messages on our Thank smartphones. You. Thank you. No, nobody, point, nobody my, is looking. But, but on the my, uh, on the other hand, we seem to get like, Rebecca, double messages. We we're told, but, look, you know, we don't want to get everybody nervous and paranoid. But on the other hand, the threat level is the <laughs> highest it's ever been. I mean, which is it? It's not. It's it's not getting paranoid. It is. Look, here, here's my belief. My belief is that terrorism, unfortunately, is a way of life. It's going to occur. But. I believe that terrorism gets way too much uh, emphasis because it is an unpredictable event. But you know what else is an unpredictable event? You, you think – I was just in Los Angeles giving a speech, and I was talking to this group of, of government officials, and they were talking to me about their plans and how prepared they were. And I said, let me ask you a question. If there's not the big one that hits California, but let's just say that there's a uh, the kind of earthquake or there's the kind of, of of accidental event that causes a blackout throughout Southern California, are you ready for that? People don't understand that when those things occur, the ATMs don't work. You can't buy gas at the gas station. More than likely, your cell phone is not going to work because the cell towers are down. And That's it's right. going to take t- it's going to take time for all of those things to come back. Well, on, I, I on have board. to tell you, you are preaching to the choir here because if your <laughs> wife thinks you're perverted, I'm perverted too. I, I've been a I, I've been working with the Red Cross on disaster relief for 25 years, so. You are definitely preaching to the choir here, sir. Uh, The minute you lose power, uh, all heck breaks loose. And uh, as you and I know, uh, we've experienced that firsthand. Uh, We're going to take a short break, but stay where you are. We'll be right back with more from Michael Brown. You're listening to the Costa Report.
Hi, I'm Joan London. If you're worried about your parent or loved one living alone, like I was, and you want reliable senior care information, then call a place for mom, the nation's largest senior living referral service. Finding an apartment that was on the courtyard with the view of the trees, the view of the ducks, the stream, the creek, all of that, that was what I needed. You'll get free information on assisted living, Alzheimer's care, nursing homes, even important financial information. Here's the number. To speak with a local senior living advisor, call a place for mom at 800-451-2976. That's 800-451-2976. A place for mom is a free service and you can trust them to help you. So if you're struggling to find reliable senior living information, there's a place for answers, a place for mom. To speak with a local senior living advisor, call a place for mom at 800-451-2976. That's 800-451-2976. Have you racked up more than $10,000 in credit card debt? Are you barely getting by, making minimum payments? You should know. The credit card companies are tricking you into thinking there's no way out. Credit card companies would rather you didn't know that there are ways you can become debt-free and you don't have to pay the entire amount you owe. There are debt relief programs that help people like you escape overwhelming credit card debt. National Debt Relief has helped tens of thousands of people just like you reduce more than $500 million of debt. National Debt Relief has helped so many people, they're A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. You don't have to declare bankruptcy or take out a consolidation loan. You have the right to settle your debt for a mere fraction of what you owe. Reduce a large portion of your debt now. Call National Debt Relief at 800-314-7417. 800-314-7417. That's 800-314-7417. Every day I wake up at 5 a.m. to give dad his medicine. Every day I wake up at 5 a.m. to give dad his medicine. At 6 a.m., I make his breakfast. Every day, I wake up at 5 a.m. to give Dad his medicine. At 6 a.m., I make his breakfast. At 7 a.m., I shower. Every day, I wake up at 5 a.m. to give Dad his medicine. At 6 a.m., I make his breakfast. At 7 a.m., I shower. I start laundry at 8. At 10, we go for a walk. Every day... I wake up at 5 a.m. For those dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers for advice, tips, and support. Together, let's help each other better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. I am done with my mattress. That's right. I'm not spending another night on this old bag. My new mattress comes today, and this thing is out of here. Bye-bye, mattress. Yep, bye-bye, mattress. So says you and about a thousand other people every day. And that's a lot of old mattresses with no place to go. There's the landfill, of course, where they just take up space. But what a waste. Because you could send it to a mattress recycler where old mattresses get broken down into steel, foam, wood, and fiber that become new steel, carpet padding, home insulation, garden mulch, biomass fuel, locomotive oil filters, and all kinds of other great stuff. So Bye Bye Mattress is right. But don't toss it. Recycle it. It's easy. And it's free. To find a mattress recycler in your area, visit ByeByeMattress.com. Back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is the former director of FEMA, Michael Brown. And before the break, you were talking about what happens when a large area loses power for a prolonged period of time, uh, which we might not necessarily consider to be a disaster. Uh, And, you know, I guess what you were saying is that the government might not prepare for something that See, you know, is not an obvious disaster like an earthquake or a tsunami or a hurricane. And uh, and that might be the thing that, uh, you know, bites us in the back. Well, I, I think it will bite us in the back. But I think, Rebecca, the, the larger problem is in any disaster, I, I don't care whether it's a natural or man-made disaster, 
it will take the government time to to get to everybody. Now, when you have a terrorist event like you like we saw in Manchester, that is localized, that is contained to a specific area. So the response that people see on the television and the news, they see that as quick, effective, and, and very efficient in what they do. But when you have something like a, a, a man-made disaster, let's take a, a large blackout that can cover, if people want to really understand what this is like, go on YouTube and, and, and search for some videos and documentaries about the 1977 blackout in New York City. New York City, parts of it, completely collapsed into chaos within a matter of hours. And, and then you think about a natural disaster the size of Katrina that you know went from the, the Florida Gulf Coast all the way over to Houston, covering hundreds of thousands of square miles. People assume that the government is going to be there instantly because what they see is that if, if we're going to uh, put troops in – in Mosul, if we're going to send troops to Syria, they wake up one day and they see, oh, look, the troops are there. The troops are taking on ISIS. The troops are fighting back in Mosul or, or in Kabul, Kabul or wherever it might be. What they don't see is that it took the Department of Defense several days, if not several weeks, to deploy all of that equipment, deploy all of those troops. And that is precisely the same thing that happens domestically in a natural or man-made so, disaster. Uh, to, I think what you're saying is that we have an unrealistic expectation Amen. of how quickly and how thoroughly the help is going to come. Amen. When you call, and, and this is a big pet peeve of mine, people need to remember that when you dial 911, you are not reaching Washington, D.C. You are reaching your local fire or police department because they are the true first responders. So in a major disaster, when it overwhelms local resources, even if, let's take Hurricane Well, Katrina, you can't get through nine, on 911. I mean, there is no well, 911 well, in a major well, disaster. And, that, and that's true, too. So, so to my point, you take something like Katrina, which I'm most infamously known for, and despite the fact that in Katrina we had the largest movement of personnel, equipment, material, food, supplies, everything in the history of the country, what people, people did not see that. What they saw were people, for example, in the Superdome who, who couldn't evacuate or didn't evacuate. So they're in the Superdome. There's food there. There's water there. But it's hot, they're miserable, and that's what the television focuses on. And what people need to understand is when I deploy all of those resources, I don't put them in harm's way. I put them, for example, in Katrina. They were placed in Dallas. They were placed in Atlanta. They were placed in Nashville so that after the disaster occurs, all of that can move in. If I had put it where the disaster was going to occur, guess what? Now all of that equipment, all of those supplies run the, a very high risk of being destroyed, and now I have to deploy additional assets. So people have come to believe that the government's going to be there, you know, Johnny on the spot, when the reality is it's going to be, which is why the government and, and people like me always advocate, you need to be ready on your well, own what, let's for get at to, least let's get to that. Hours. Well, let's get to that. What, what, what does ready mean? I need water and I need batteries. You need, you need, and of course you and I are in the radio business and this is not self-serving, but it's actually true. You need a battery powered radio because you're not going to be able to get your television. You need to have enough food that you can eat. And not, I'm not talking microwavable food. I'm not talking about food that's going to spoil because you're not, you're not going to have power in your refrigerator. So you're going to have to have enough food, whether it's, peanut butter and crackers, I don't care what it is, but enough things to sustain yourself for at least 72 hours. And if you do that, you will be better off than 99% of the people in this country. So it's we're talking food, water, and some way to uh, be able to listen to the news. Well, you know, you're not uh, going to be, your, your, your cell phones aren't going to be able to be powered up. There's no electricity, 
right? right. So you can't you can't power up, and and also the most of the time in these disasters, your cell phones are useless the first twenty four forty eight hours, anyways, depending yeah. on how bad right. the disaster is. But depending right. on where you live in the country, your preparations might be slightly different, isn't that right? Oh, it's always different. You have mm-hmm. to you have to think about: Do you live in a rural area? Do you live in an urban area? Do you live in the city center? All of these things take into account what you need. So, for example, I, I live in a suburb of, suburb of Denver, so I've got different ways that uh, that you know, a small generator. I've got things that I can just in case the 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 internet comes back up. I've got ways to power my devices so I can communicate with outside friends or family. Uh, I've got enough food, enough things that I can eat so that I can survive. And frankly, I'm I'm prepared for a week because hopefully what I'm going to do is, and and I'm, I'm I'm privileged. I I bet you're pretty popular in your neighborhood. (laughs) Uh, I don't, I don't. I I I bet there's a lot of people thinking they're going to come over to your place. And, and, and I don't want to be popular because I've prepared for myself. I haven't prepared for the hundreds of people that live around me. Yeah, well, but, that was the problem. Since I was a Red Cross worker, everyone said, well, you know, we are somewhat prepared, but if things really go bad, we're coming to your house. And I said, no, we're going to, that's no, right. we're, going to Rebecca's we're not, house. we're not that good of friends. <laughs> right, right, right. That's, that, exact, that, that's exactly right. right. Are, are there some areas that you're impressed with? Are there states or major cities that you're in, that in your opinion have better warning systems and seem better prepared to handle, let's say, large blackouts, even? At disasters at that level? Well, I, I think, let me go just go through a list of places and tell you what I think they're really good about. Mm-hmm. I think New York is really good in terms of its counterintelligence system so that they are prepared for another 9-11. Mm-hmm. I do not believe that New York is prepared for a catastrophic disaster like a Category 5 hurricane going up the Hudson River and flooding most of, of lower Manhattan or midtown Manhattan. They're good on the terrorism aspect. They're not really good on the natural disaster. Then you take a state like Florida. Florida, both Republican governors and Democrat governors have learned over the course of the past, you know, well, primarily since Hurricane Andrew, but even since before then, that Florida is a target for hurricanes. So Florida is really good and really prepared for that. Houston had a tropical storm back in 2001, 2002, I forget. Tropical storm, um, uh, that gamut, I can't remember the name of it, but that taught Houston a lesson, and mm-hmm. Houston has now learned to prepare and mitigate for hurricanes and tropical storms coming up the, the Gulf Coast. Okay, well, we've got to take another commercial break, but stay tuned. When we come back, we'll learn about other areas of the country that are prepared for disasters and what kinds of disasters they're ready for. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Scott, we keep hearing about the wines that are being developed in Monterey County. How would you describe the climate conditions for grapes? Monterey County has a lot of little pockets that give you the opportunity to grow a variety of grapes. It comes down to the match of location and climate with the varietal that you're going to grow. And where we grow in the highlands, it's prototypical cool climate. We're even in the northern side of the highlands. So that is ideal for both Pinot and Chardonnay. Chardonnay strives really well in a lot of our county, as well as Pinot, but I would say that this is the most optimal location. You get wind, you get sun exposure, the benches come off of the inland side of the coastal mountains. It's an optimal position. You can order any of our products directly from us by visiting our website, caracciolicellars.com, or calling the tasting room directly, 831-622-7722. I'm Paul George of the Indiana Pacers. When I was six, I had one thing on my mind. When I was six, my days were spent playing basketball every chance I could. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. So I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. I'm Paul George, 
Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke F A S T. Fast. Life is why. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Women now make up 37% of the workforce, changing their role forever. Harvard Medical School has now opened its doors to new female applicants. The first woman is now in space. The majority of last year's doctorate degrees were earned by women. We've come so far, but our news is changing for the worse. More women die from heart disease and stroke than men, even though it can be prevented. Make a change at GoRedForWomen.org today. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women. Okay, what are you wearing right now? Nothing. That's right. So mommy's going to teach you how to dress yourself. Underwear always comes first. Name tag at the back, then pants, then shirt. Get the first button in the right hole or you have to start all over. Socks going first, then shoes right on right, left on left. With shoelaces, just take the ends, cross them over, switch the loops. The rabbit goes down the hole, pull tight, and you're left with bunny ears. Got it? Why are your pants on your head? Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day, making sure they brush their teeth is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Visit 2 min 2 xorg to find out more. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. Psst. Yeah, you. It's me, your heart. Listen to me. We've got to talk. High blood pressure is serious, and yours? Whoa. What happened to us? We used to be so much more active. But lately, you've been ignoring me. I know you think I'm just going to keep ticking away forever, but you're wrong. You can do so much more to control your high blood pressure. Doing the minimum isn't doing enough. I'm under a lot of pressure and can quit whenever I want. Bet you didn't know that. But I like my job. Just treat me better. Check on me. Give me something green to nibble on every once in a while. And maybe we can do some exercise on occasion. Let's get to it. After all, we're in this together. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get your blood pressure to a healthy range before it's too late. Find out how at heart.org slash blood pressure. Check, change, control. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is Michael Brown. And before the break, you were saying that New York is very well prepared for a terrorist attack, but not very well prepared for natural disasters such as superstorms and and other kinds of things uh, uh, along those lines. Whereas the state of Florida is prepared for hurricanes, but perhaps not in other types of disasters. So it sounds like it's a bit hit and miss. It, it really is, and 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 that's because we're such a huge, diverse geographical country that everybody has a different set of circumstances. I mean, again, I go back to just in, in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, speaking to the Los Angeles Public Health Department. When I look at what the Public Health Department has done in Los Angeles and how they're trying to coordinate, I think I counted up almost 600 different municipalities uh, special districts, all sorts of government organizations within the, you know, the city and county of L.A., and trying to coordinate all of the response that you would have to a, to a pandemic or an epidemic or any sort of public health crisis, they've done a very good job of that. But California at large, I think, while they've done really good things about building codes and retrofitting for earthquakes, no one's thought about the actual – and look, it makes me mad, Rebecca, that we have – um, move, what was the movie about uh, the, oh, San Andreas? And, and so the movie San Andreas pictures, you know, an, an earthquake along the San Andreas Fault and San Francisco collapses in on itself and everything else. No, come on, let's get real. If the San Andreas Fault starts shifting, I'm more concerned about the lack of communications, the, the lack of power, the inability of, of grocery stores that have, you know, daily deliveries to keep things stocked. All of that kind of stuff is going to shut down. And I don't think that California has really thought through what, and we throw the word catastrophic around way too cavalierly. Catastrophic means that you're going to have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people displaced. You're going to have not 72 hours, but but perhaps weeks or months or maybe even a year where the kinds of infrastructure that you and I rely upon 
you and I are, I mean, you're sitting in your studio. I'm sitting in my home studio. Uh, we're both surrounded by electronics. We depend upon these things. And when those things go down, and they go down for any length of time, you and I, are because we think about these things, are not going to be shocked by it, and we're going to be upset about it, but I mean we're literally not going to go into shock about it. Some people are going to literally go into a medical condition of shock because everything that is normal for them, turning on a, a light switch, flushing a, a, a toilet, going to the grocery store, making a phone call, all of the, going to the gas station and using your credit card, going to an ATM, those things are not going to be available. And the brain will – I talked to a friend of mine that's a, a doctor at Harvard, and we, and we were talking about how when, when the brain is so accustomed to things working and then things don't work the way they're supposed to, you tend to shut down. And I think people are going to do that in some of these catastrophic events. And I think you bring up a good point because one of the things, one of the lessons that we learned from Katrina and also from 9-11 is the duration. You know, most yeah. of our, yeah, most most of the kinds of uh, disaster relief that we see, the government as well as the American Red Cross Salvation Army, their philosophy is in and out. Right. They they get right. in, That's they correct. clean it up, and they give people enough time to make preparations of their own, find their yeah. own housing, you know, get back on their feet again. Give them just enough to calm down, figure out a plan, and execute that plan. And then the government, and particularly the American Red Cross, who I'm familiar with, needs to get out. But yeah. two years after Hurricane Katrina, the Red Cross still had shelters open, and they, they weren't geared up for that. And, and the country is not geared up for that. We did one of the things that I was. We don't understand was, long-term disaster relief. Uh, amen. And the other thing we don't understand is, and I was shocked to learn this, since FEMA was created in 1979, they had never done true catastrophic disaster planning. So what I got, what I convinced Congress to do, I came up with ten different scenarios that I wanted, you know millions of dollars to do planning for these catastrophic events. You didn't and get it. You didn't get the I millions. Didn't, I, 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 I didn't get it. And I can tell you that since DHS. And you paid the price. March, I paid the price. You paid the price the, for that. But, but here's the more important point. DHS was stood up on March 3, 2003. We are now in 2017. We still have not done the kind of catastrophic planning for, for these kinds of things. New Orleans is a fishbowl. Do you think we've truly learned about what happens if the levees collapse? I mentioned New York earlier. Can you imagine a Category 5 hurricane instead of, you know, bouncing off and going out into the Atlantic, going up the Hudson River? Can you truly imagine what I just described in California of the, the big one hitting or, even worse, a terrorist event where you take out the grid in California and now people are without they're, – they're without the ability to deliver food to grocery stores, to communicate, to do their jobs, to get cash out of the bank. It is that kind of catastrophic planning that this nation is not prepared for. Well, Mr. Brown, uh, I'm with you. I hope everybody listening today takes uh, your vision of what could happen and goes out in this – holiday weekend, hopefully, you know, take a few minutes to think about the safety of yourself and your family, your loved ones, your right, neighborhood, just, just and, and, and make, right. a, you know, make, make a few preparations. Uh, yeah. it's, it's important. It's worth taking a few, a uh, few hours a year to just think about this and, uh, and proactively do something about it. Mr. Brown, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we're just out of time here. I could keep you uh, for several hours to talk about this and I hope that you'll come back and visit us again. It was a pleasure speaking Anytime. with you. Anytime. Now, nor now, normally around this time, we take a short break, but before we take a break, I want to tell you about a way you can prepare every night for dinner, which according to my children, sometimes turns into an unplanned disaster. <laughs> my family's new habit is the number one fresh ingredient uh, recipe delivery service in the country, Blue Apron. 
for under $10 a person. All the ingredients along with an easy step-by-step recipe to make a healthy gourmet meal are delivered right to our front door. Ingredients like sustainably sourced seafood and beef, chicken, and pork from responsibly raised animals and produce from farms that practice regenerative farming. What's more, from box to table, these one-of-a-kind recipes take less than 40 minutes for us to make which is why so many couples and families are getting into the Blue Apron habit. It's one way to get the entire family working together in the kitchen. And since Blue Apron delivers the exact amount of each ingredient, there's never any food wasted. I like that. Blue Apron offers such a wide variety of meals. Even the pickiest eaters will find something to cheer about. Choose from meals like beef teriyaki stir fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice, Or baked spinach and egg flatbread with sautéed asparagus and lemon aioli. Or crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme fraiche. Right now, Blue Apron has an offer that makes it easy to try them out. Three free meals when you order at blueapron.com slash Costa. And by free, I mean the shipping is even free. So stop what you're doing and jump on this offer so you can enjoy cooking together this week. Go to blueapron.com slash Costa. Be sure you get slash Costa in there. If you don't put the slash Costa in there, you're not going to get the three free meals with the free shipping. One more time, that's blueapron dot com slash costa do it now before this offer expires and you know look folks you're getting three free meals there's no downside here try it out i promise you you'll get into a regular habit of using blue apron my kids uh my kids are picky eaters and i gotta tell you there's something on their menu for everyone i have never been i've never had it so easy as a mother so uh now Go to blueapron.com slash Costa. Do it before the offer expires. We have to take another short break. When we come back, I'll tell you what I learned about emergency response when I was deployed by the American Red Cross. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. Week after week, listeners ask me, Rebecca, when's your new book coming out? Folks, I am happy to report that On the Verge will be available in bookstores throughout the country on September 6th. Just in case you haven't read The Watchman's Rattle yet, you have the entire summer to get caught up. Go to RebeccaCosta.com, Amazon, or any bookstore to get your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Get your copy now, so when On the Verge hits the bookstores, you'll be ready for what comes next. When I say Italy, what comes to mind? Venice. Capri. Oh, my gosh. Capri was marvelous. The views, the cliffside views, or traveling to Sorrento. Pirello Tours. Oh, Pirello Tours, for sure. Pirello. Hi, I'm Steve Pirello of Pirello Tours. With over 70 years of tour experience to Italy, it's no wonder Pirello Tours is synonymous with travel to Italy. I think of the culture. And to walk up to certain areas and touch a wall and think, well, this wall is like 3,000 years old. Being on a Pirello Tour on our anniversary was better than anything I can remember ever on an anniversary. I personally approve every itinerary to ensure a stress-free, once-in-a-lifetime vacation. Salute! Call now for your free insider's guide to Perillo's Italy. Call in the next 30 minutes and qualify for a $100 gift card when you travel with us. Call 800-897-7176. 800-897-7176. 800-897-7176. Hi there, I'm Bob Eubanks. You know, as part of Hollywood for a long time, I've seen my fair share of celebrities get in trouble with the IRS. Well, there's one name I trust, the Tax Defense Group. So if you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS, you really need to call my friends at the Tax Defense Group. They offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And they're open 24 hours a day because they know that tax debt doesn't sleep either. Call 800-257-2910. 800-257-2910. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to mooch off your friends. You gonna finish that grape? You mean the one in my mouth? You don't need to stop buying the necessities. What you're smelling is a natural musk. Ew. You don't need to be a medical test subject. How do you feel? 
Mostly okay. I... <laughs> Sometimes, though. <laughs> you don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman. Let's break for lunch. You just need an internet connection. Don't get left behind. Start your personal savings plan with the tips and tools on feedthepig.org. That way, you don't need to sell your soul to the devil. Fifteen bucks is the best I can do. All right, deal. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Hey, America, we need to have a little talk. I don't know if you've noticed, but we got a lot of food in this country. A lot of peaches, a lot of corn, a lot of apples, a lot of everything. We've got so much food that we can't even eat it all. So if we got all this extra food, how are 17 million kids in America struggling with hunger? I just don't get it. That's why the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and gets it to the hungry kids who need it. They can get you food even if you live in Idaho or Alaska or somewhere crazy like that. This isn't complicated. We've got extra food and we've got hungry kids. Feeding America's done the math. Now it's your turn. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. I know you got internet on your phone, so what are you waiting for? We can't do it without your help. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest this hour has been Michael Brown, who was our nation's first undersecretary of emergency preparedness and response and director of FEMA. Brown was not only instrumental in the recovery efforts following 9-11, but also headed up the Hurricane Katrina response, an effort he was largely criticized by the media for. That said, in hindsight... We can now see that all government agencies, uh, including nonprofits like the Red Cross, Salvation Army, and others, were completely overwhelmed by the magnitude and the duration of the Katrina disaster. At the time Katrina occurred, I had long been an emergency response volunteer for the American Red Cross, and I had experience driving emer- emergency vehicles for the Red Cross and helping set up shelters and kitchens, training volunteers on the ground, and delivering hot meals to hard-hit neighborhoods. So I can tell you that at the onset, the Red Cross treated Katrina like they would any other disaster. Trained volunteers from every state in the country flew into the area to do what they do best, deal with the emergency at hand by providing what people needed immediately after a disaster, and then give victims time to make their own arrangements. That's how it works. That's what the Red Cross does. This is the mission of the Red Cross and other emergency organizations. They come in, take care of business, and then they get out. But from the moment Red Cross workers arrived at Katrina, they realized something was different. There was no law enforcement, no government officials to provide leadership and direction. Communications were down. Roads were blocked. Power was down. There was nowhere for the Red Cross to set up. And even when experienced teams figured out a way to deliver services, supply lines needed to obtain basics such as clean water and medicines and blankets and and beds, they were completely blocked. It took weeks to get up and running, which anyone working for the Red Cross will tell you is not the way the Red Cross normally operates. But that was just the beginning of the overwhelm. As I said earlier, the Red Cross has a charter to get in and get out. They provide temporary assistance so people have time to make arrangements of their own. But in the case of Katrina, the population affected was so poor, they had no ability to make arrangements of their own. And two years after Katrina hit, the Red Cross still had shelters open for folks who had nowhere to go. A situation the Red Cross had never encountered before and which nearly bankrupted the entire organization. Now, I tell you this story because it's really easy to point fingers at the U.S. government and claim that they were ill-prepared for Katrina or to blame Brown for the chaotic response. But what I want you to know is that every organization 
that was experienced and trained to handle disasters and emergencies was overwhelmed by Katrina. There was not one organization prepared for the magnitude or the duration of the aftermath. And you heard Brown today, we still aren't. Now, I learned three important lessons from my work with the Red Cross and disasters like Katrina. The first is that you can tell people to evacuate, buy water for 72 hours, store food, buy extra batteries, stock up on medicines in advance. But for those living hand to mouth, you might as well tell them to buy a first class ticket to, uh, to Paris. They don't have the means to leave or do any of the things that they're asked to do. It's not true that we always have a choice. It's not true that we can prepare in advance. Some people don't have the money to leave, the means to leave, or the money to prepare. And the, and, and, and so I, I think there's sort of a fiction that is perpetrated out there, that if the government gives you warning, get out. It's not that easy. The second lesson I learned is that it it may take years to recover from a disaster and and the government and organizations like the Red Cross don't have a plan that extends for years. The government and nonprofits presently operate on a model that requires them to get in and get out as quickly and efficiently as possible. But for large scale disasters, that isn't going to cut it. We need a different model, one designed to deal with victims whose circumstances prior to the disaster were already so challenging that there's no way for them to come back, no way for them to recover. And lastly, I learned that people do pull together during times of duress. We were designed by nature to be a troop-dwelling organism. We, We don't do well alone. We were never designed to be alone. And in times of danger, you see us band together to increase the odds in our favor. This is in our DNA. So when disasters happen, whether they're man-made or they're natural, as we're now seeing occur in Manchester, England, we see a side of humanity that gives us hope that we can indeed come together and triumph over adversity particularly when there is a disaster involved. I will tell you that I have seen ordinary citizens do extraordinary things for complete strangers in the face of a disaster. And it has made me an extremely optimistic human being. I know that when push comes to shove, most of us will step up. Now, today we've been talking about how to prepare and respond to unexpected emergencies. And speaking of unplanned emergencies, there's nothing more that affects our day-to-day work life than finding ourselves shorthanded. Everyone knows that when you have a job that's open and we can't fill it, it taxes everyone who has to cover for that open position. So it's important to find the right person for the job as quickly as you can. And that's where ZipRecruiter comes in. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites with one click. Then powerful technology matches the right person to your job. And everyone knows that if there's a way to post a job just one time and have it appear on 100 job sites, how much time that's going to save and just how much you increase the odds of locating that perfect person for your opening. That is why ZipRecruiter is different. It's used by thousands of businesses, small and large. And unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. You find them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter locate a qualified candidate in just 24 hours, one day. So ZipRecruiter is not only thorough, it's fast. What else can you ask for? It's thorough. It's fast. It covers all your bases. It minimizes the time investment that you have. No more juggling emails or calls to your office. You you simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Now, I know, you know, I've run businesses for a long time, folks. I, I, I think I've had my own businesses for, I don't know, the past 25 years or so. And I will tell you that it is very, very hard to find good people. 
you, you would you would think that for for a program like this, the Costa report that's on in all fifty states, that you know we'd have uh, resumes coming in all the time, and we do, we do, we have a lot of people applying for jobs with us. You know, but finding the extraordinary person, the person that is experienced, talented, and will go that extra distance is not that easy. And so you really do have to cover all bases. So do yourself a favor. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. It won't cost you one nickel. That's right, free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash report. Be sure you get that word report in there. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash report. One more time to try it for completely free to fill that opening that you don't have time to fill and that's taxing everybody else that's working for you. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash report. Post your job one time. Have it show up in 100 locations, 100 job boards. Doesn't get any better than that. And, uh, and then fill that job and, and make it easy for the other people that are having to, to cover for that empty spot. And that just about wraps up our first hour. If your station is leaving us after this first hour, my guest next week was the chief financial officer of Pixar and the man responsible for making the founder of Apple Computer, Steve Jobs, a billionaire. Mr. Lawrence Levy will be here to tell us what's next in animation and about life after Pixar. Don't miss Lawrence Levy next week right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, it's MZ from KSCO in Santa Cruz. And though I don't care much for people who brag, I'm going to do just a little of it now and hope you will give me a pass by calling it Just Being Proud. Our station can afford to be innovative and refreshingly different because we use education and logic to promote great health products that change people's lives for the better. We also help people build strong businesses that create residual income through a wonderful low-cost business opportunity that we have developed and refined during the last 20 years. We believe that Rebecca Costa's large audience is comprised of particularly intelligent and educated persons, some of whom may want to earn more money. If you are tired of being someone else's wage slave and are ready to go to work building your own excellent supplement business that can provide you and your family income and become a saleable and willable asset, I want to talk with you. Send an email to mz at we don't have to be poor.com. That's mz at we don't have to be poor.com. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. I improved my credit score. You're kidding, right? Uh, no. How are we supposed to be the bad boys of electrosynth pop if you're out there being responsible? The band is about to be discovered. This is our year. Uh, yeah, you've been saying that for a while now. You think anyone in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was worried about their credit score? I never really thought that Of you're... course they weren't. Rock stars aren't supposed to think about that kind of stuff. We're supposed to think about how many guitars we've smashed, write aggressively sensitive power ballads, start questionable fashion trends, tragically break up and blame creative differences. All right, all right, just... I thought maybe it was time to take control of my finances, you know? Start using a budget. Get out of debt. Set some goals. A budget? Debt? Set some goals? Listen, I knew that we'd have our creative differences, but I was hoping they'd involve a little more scandal. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. The Costa Report is now heard in all 50 states on fine radio stations, including this one.